I'm very happy to greet all of you wonderful students here this morning and your leaders. And I understand that you have a group of missionaries here, as you did a year ago when I spoke at devotional. So, being a missionary, I decided when I was trying to decide what to speak about this morning to tell you some of my missionary experiences. I think that you get more out of that than if I try to discuss any particular subject or principle of the gospel. If you don't think I could, read the books I've written and you'll know <laughs> that I could. First, I start way back in 1905 when I went on my first mission to Holland. My cousin and I rode together till we reached Liverpool, and he was sent up into Norway, the land of the midnight sun, and I was sent into Holland. And after we'd been in the mission field a few months, I received a letter from him calling me by name, and he said, I met a man the other day who knows more about religion than I've ever dreamed of. And I told him if he had something better than I had, I'd join his church. So I wrote him back and called him by name, and I said, if he has something better than you have, you ought to join his church. But I said, does he have something better than a personal visitation to this earth after centuries of darkness of God, the eternal Father, and his Son, Jesus Christ, to usher in the dispensation of the fullness of times and reveal the real personality of God and his Son, Jesus Christ. I said, does he have something better than the coming of Moroni with the plates from which the Book of Mormon was translated and gives us the history of God's dealing with his prophets in this land of America over a period of a thousand years. I said, does he have something better than the coming back to this earth of, of John the Baptist who was beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and restored the Aaronic priesthood, the power to baptize by immersion for the remission of sins? Does he have something better than the coming of Peter, James, and John, who are upon the Mount of Transfiguration with the Savior and return to this earth to restore the holy priesthood, the power of the apostleship, with power to organize the church and kingdom of God upon the earth? Does he have something better than the coming of Moses with the keys of the gathering of Latter-day Israel? Does he have something better than the coming of Elijah, the prophet of whose coming Malachi testified that before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, the Lord would send Elijah the prophet to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest he come and smite the whole earth with a curse. Now that's an important mission. I said, if he has something better than that, you ought to join his church. I tell the missionaries that if you learn how to tell our story, you never need to argue with anybody. You tell them things they've never heard of, and you prove them to them out of the large holy scriptures. When I was part of the Southern States Mission, 
I preached a sermon down in Quitman, Georgia on the eternal duration of the marriage covenant and the family unit. And I quoted from uh, Rulon Howell's book, Do Men Believe What Their Churches Prescribe? And along one side, he has the names uh, uh, of all of the important subjects and across the top, the names of the various large churches of the world. And I read from that the book, not one of the major churches believed in the eternal duration of the marriage covenant and the family unit. And as the meeting closed, I stood at the door shaking hands with the people who were there, and a man came up and introduced himself as a Baptist minister. And I said, did I misquote you here tonight? No, Mr. Richards, but it's like you say, we don't all believe all the things that our churches teach. I said, you don't believe them either. Why don't you go back and teach your people the truth? They'll take it from you, and they're not ready to take it from the Mormon elders yet. He said, I'll see you again. I didn't see him for about four months when I went back <coughs> to that branch. <coughs> My coming was announced in the newspaper. As I walked up to that little church, there stood that Baptist minister. And as we shook hands, I said, I'd certainly be interested to know what you thought of my talk here the last time I was here. He said, Mr. Richards, I've been thinking about it ever since. I believe every word you said, only I'd like to have heard the rest of it. Now, you know, we never get talked out when we get to talking about the principles of the gospel. Now, there is a man occupying his pulpit in the Baptist church who believed every word I'd said, <clears throat> and yet he couldn't preach it to his people. In the Book of Mormon, we read of when Lehi was in the desert, and he told his son Joseph that the Lord had promised Joseph, who was sold into Egypt, that in the latter days he would raise up a prophet from his loins whose name would be Joseph and whose father's name would be Joseph. Now, obviously, that was Joseph Smith. And he said, that prophet shall bring forth my word. The prophet Joseph brought us the Book of Mormon, the Doctrine and Covenants, the Pearl of Great Price, and many other writings he has given us more revealed truth than any prophet who's ever lived upon the face of the earth as far as our records are concerned. And that was written in the Book of Mormon before this church was ever organized. And then he said, he shall not only bring forth my word, but he shall bring men to conviction of my word that has already gone forth among them. What do you mean by that? That in this world where there are hundreds of different churches preaching men's interpretation of the scriptures, that the Lord would give this new prophet an understanding of the scriptures to reveal them in the spirit in which they were written. And then he adds, and he shall bring men unto salvation. Why? because this prophet would be clothed upon by the holy priesthood, the power to administer the saving ordinances of the gospel. And then the Lord adds, and he shall be great in mine eyes, whatever the world may think of this prophet of this dispensation, there's the testimony of the Lord that he shall be great in mine eyes. Now, referring to the statement, and he shall bring men to conviction 
of my word has already gone forth among them. I want to tell you of a little experience I had when I was in Holland. I had an invitation from some businessmen to attend one of their Bible classes. They'd meet every week in one of the homes. We met in the home of a prominent furniture dealer. There were about 20 men there. The only woman was the, sick, the uh, daughter of the man of the house. They gave me an hour and a half to discuss universal salvation, which includes our doctrine of preaching the gospel in the eternal worlds to the spirits that were disobedient here upon the earth and the doctrine of baptism of the living for the dead. And so, after I discussed that matter, I just gave them chapter and verse and let them read it in their own Bibles. I figured that they would believe it more if they read it in their Bibles, otherwise they'd think that I had a different Bible. Then when I was through, I laid my book on the table and folded my arms and waited for, an, uh, for a comment. The first comment came from the daughter of the man of the house. She said, Father, I just can't understand it. She said, I have never attended one of these Bible classes in my life that you haven't had the last word to say on everything, and tonight you haven't said a word. He shook his head and said, my daughter, there isn't anything to say. This man has been teaching us things we never heard of, and he's been teaching them to us out of our own Bibles. That's what I meant, what the Lord meant when he said that this prophet of this dispensation would not only bring forth his word, but would bring men to conviction of his word that had already gone forth among them. Now along that line, some years ago, the Congregational and Evangelical Churches of these Western states, California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Utah, Nevada, were holding a conference of their leaders and ministers in Salt Lake. And the leader of the group wrote a letter to President McKay and asked him if he would send one of the general authorities of the church to attend the morning session of their conference and tell them the story of Mormonism, and then to remain as their guest for lunch, and then to remain for an hour and a half in the afternoon and let them ask questions. I got the assignment. And I don't mind telling you, I was happy to get it. I tell the missionaries, you'll never need to argue with anybody if you learn how to tell our story and you keep the lead. So, <laughs> when I arrived, I said, do you want it just the way we got our church and what we believe? The man in charge said, that's just what we want. Some of them wanted to get away on earlier planes to up the Northwest. So they set the luncheon back a half an hour so that they could give me two hours and a half in that morning meeting. And I presented our message to them just about on the same way that I have it in the marvelous work and the wonder which many of you have read, showing what we got by revelation rather than by ref reformation. The churches of this world have not been able to agree because they have not understood the scriptures and they have tried to interpret them, and no two of them could agree, so that there, that has brought into the world so many churches. But we have a gospel that's come 
direct from heaven when I wrote the marvelous work and the wonder I predicated on the thought that we were the only Christian church in the world that didn't get our religion out of the Bible. We got it by revelation from heaven, and then we take the Bible to prove that what we have is what we should have. So, as I, after I had presented what we got by revelation, and I've already re referred to a little of that when I told you about my cousin who was up in Norway. Uh, then I said, while I was the presiding bishop of the church, we had the building program of the church. We had the plans prepared for the Los Angeles temple. One day we took those plans and showed them to the first presidency. We had 84 pages about four feet long and two and a half feet wide. We didn't have the electrical nor the plumbing plans complete, and yet there was that temple built spiritually, and there wasn't a hole in the ground. I said, you could take those plans and go all over this world and try to fit them to every building in the world, and there's only one building they'll fit and that's the Mormon temple down in Los Angeles. Oh, I said, of course, you can find buildings that have material in them, like in that temple, such as lumber, cement, tiling, electric wiring, and plumbing, but you can't find any other building in the world that those plans will fit except the Mormon temple in Los Angeles. Then I held up the Bible. I said, here's the Lord's blueprint. Isaiah said the Lord had declared the end from the beginning. It's all here when you know how to understand it. Isaiah said the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Now I said you could take this the Lord's blueprint and try to fit it to every church in this world. And there's only one church that it'll fit, and that's the Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints. Oh, I said, of course, you can find other churches that have some things in them, like in this, the Lord's blueprint, but you can't find any other church that this, the Lord's blueprint, will fit. Now I said, I'll proceed to illustrate to you what I mean. In Karen Farr's Life of Christ, he said there were two passages in the New Testament for which he could find no excuse. The first was John 10 and 16, where Jesus said, Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also must I bring and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. I said, do any of you men know why that's in the Bible? No answer. Do any of you know any church in the world that does know why it's in the Bible? No answer. Well, we know all about it. Then I tied it in to what I told them about the promise of Moses to Joseph who was sold into Egypt of a new land separated from his brethren, the utmost bounds of the everlasting hills, and describing that land, Moses uses the precious, the word precious, five times in just four little verses. Do any of you know where that land of Joseph is? No answer. Do any of you know any church in the world that does know where it is? No answer. Well, we know all about it. I said, it's the land of America. And then I led up to where the Lord commanded Ezekiel that the two records should be kept, one of Judah and his followers, of the house of Israel, and then one of Joseph and his followers, the house of Israel. And in the days of their children, that is in the latter days, when they would say, wilt thou not tell us what thou meanest by these Say unto them that I, the Lord, 
will take the stick of Joseph, it's in the hands of Ephraim, and I will put it with the stick of Judah, and I will make them one in my hand. Do any of you, I said, know where that stick or record of Joseph is that the Lord commanded should be written? No answer. Well, we know all about it. It's the Book of Mormon. And when you get the Book of Mormon, you read about when Jesus visited his people here in the land of America, and he told them that they were the other sheep of whom he spoke to his disciples in Jerusalem. He said, never at any time had the Lord commanded him to tell his disciples who the other sheep were, only that he had other sheep that were not of this fold. See how beautifully the scriptures fit together when you understand them. The second passage that Canon Farrer couldn't understand is 1 Corinthians 15 and 29, when Paul said, else why are they baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? I said, do any of you know why that's in the Bible? No answer. Do any of you know any church in the world that does know why it's in the Bible? No answer. Well, we know all about it. <laughs> then I told them that when that Peter said that Jesus was put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which he went and preached to the spirits that were disobedient in the days of Noah, when the ark was being prepared, when a few that is, eight souls were saved by water. Now I said, obviously, if Jesus preached to them, his gospel was faith, repentance, and baptism by immersion for the remission of sins and the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. And since you can't baptize a spirit in water, the Lord had to give them a vicarious Ba baptism of the living for the dead so that that holy and sacred ordinance could be performed for them. Peter said, therefore, is the gospel preached to them that are dead, that they might live according to God in the spirit and be judged according to men in the flesh. And Paul tells us that all men shall be judged by his gospel. That helps you to understand what Jesus meant when he said, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. The world has interpreted that to mean those who are dead in sin. But Jesus amplified it by saying, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming when they that are in their graves shall hear the voice of the Son of God. See how beautifully that fits together. Then I told, gave those men some more passages like the kingdom that God was to set up in the latter days and the heavens were to receive the Christ until the restitution of all things spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets, and then the angel that was to bring the gospel in the latter days to be preached to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And in each one, I would say, do you know why these passages are in the scripture as part of the Lord's blueprint? Do you know any church in the world that claims that these things have been fulfilled? You see how beautiful, beautifully the gospel fits together and all these beautiful fulfillments of the words of the holy prophets. When I, oh then, toward the close of my remarks, the man in charge said, now Mr. Richards, we've heard it said that you believe that God has a wife. Would you explain that to us? I think he thought he had me over a barrel or in a corner that I couldn't get out. So rather facetiously, I said, well, 
I don't see how in the world he could have a son without a wife. Do you? And they all began to twitter, and I didn't have any trouble with that question. <laughs> Those ministers and church leaders wanted to have an hour and a half to ask questions, and after listening to me for two hours and a half, I got that one question from them, and that was the only one. The man in charge when I left them said, Mr. Richards, this has been one of the most interesting experiences of my entire life. No wonder Isaiah said it would be a marvelous work and a wonder. That's what it is to me, and that's what every missionary ought to make it be to those who are yet in darkness. Now, um, I'll tell you a little experience. I had a debate with a minister over in Amsterdam when I was on my first mission. One of the saints invited me to come to her home. She wanted to invite her neighbor in and let me preach the gospel to her. When my companion and I went to that home, the neighbor was there, but she brought her minister with her. Well, we had a little difference of opinion on the discussion of priesthood, and right there, he challenged me for a debate in his church. And I was young and had a lot of ump in me, and I accepted the challenge. <laughs> we were not advised in those days not to challenge. When we arrived in his church on Saturday night, according to appointment, that church was full. All of his people were there, but all of our people were there. I didn't know how our people found it out. I didn't tell him. <laughs> he stood up and said, now inasmuch as Mr. Richards is a guest in our church, we'll accord him the privilege of opening the debate. And we'll each talk for 20 minutes and continue as long as it's mutually agreeable. He said, is that satisfactory to you, Mr. Richards? And I said, very much. I didn't tell him, but I would have given him the shirt off of my back for the privilege of opening that debate and he just handed it to me on a silver platter. <laughs> I didn't know whether the Lord had anything to do with that or not, but I always thought he did. So I stood up and I said, the last time I talked to my friend here, we had a difference of opinion on the principle of priesthood. I've come here tonight prepared to discuss that subject, but I don't propose to start at that point. I said, if you were going to build a house, you wouldn't try to put the roof on it until you got the foundation in, because if the foundation were faulty, it wouldn't be any good to put the roof on because the house would fall. So I said, I propose to open this debate by laying the foundation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I choose for my text the sixth chapter of Hebrews, where Paul said, leaving the principles of the gospel of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of faith toward God, repentance of dead works, the doctrine of baptisms, the laying on of hands, eternal judgment, the resurrection, and eternal judgment. I heard over faith and repentance. I thought they believed that. I spiked down baptism by immersion for the remission of sins till everybody in the audience was giving me approval. Then it came to the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. They didn't believe that. They thought the Holy Ghost came just like the breezes that blow over your head. And you remember when uh, 
the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God through the preaching of Philip, they sent Peter and John to them. And when they came, they prayed for these men. They laid their hands upon them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon the sorcerer saw that the Holy Ghost was conveyed by laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give unto me this power, that upon whomsoever I lay my hands, they may receive the Holy Ghost like unto these. And Peter said, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast meant that the gifts of God can be purchased with money. Then I gave them another reference or two on the laying on of hands out of the Bible, and then I sat down. This man stood up. He never mentioned a word I'd said. He started on the mountain, met a massacre and the golden Bible, and Joseph Smith admitted that he'd made many mistakes. And then he turned to me and he said, now if Mr. Richards will explain these matters, this audience will be most appreciative. I was on my feet just like that. <laughs> my, com my companion said, how'd you think so fast? I said, what have you been praying for all week long? I said, I said, in the days when I got on my feet, I said, in the days of the Savior, his enemies tried to trick him with cunningness and craftiness. I said, I don't suppose there's anybody here today that'd like to see us resort to those old tactics. I said, uh, <laughs> this friend of mine offered me the courtesy of opening the debate as a guest in his church, and now he wants to steal from me the very courtesy that he extended to me, and I don't propose to let him do it. So I said, now, my friend, you can have your 20 minutes over again. And he couldn't do it, and I knew he couldn't. His wife stood up in the audience and said, what Mr. Richards is asking is fair. You ought to answer him. Then he couldn't do it. I said to my companion, stand up and give me my coat and hat. It was winter time. And I said, one more chance. I'm willing to remain here till 10 o'clock tomorrow morning when I have to be in my own church, provided this debate can go forward on the basis that you sent it up. But if not, I'm going to leave and ask my companions to leave and after I ask our saints to leave, and we'll leave it to you to settle with your people for what's happened here today, tonight. And then he couldn't do it, and we all walked out on him. I met him on the street time and time again after that. He ducked his head so he didn't have to speak to me. Now, brothers and sisters, as you've listened to me this morning, I think you can understand why I tell missionaries, you never need to argue with anybody if you learn how to tell our story. And it's the sweetest story that's been told in this world since the resurrection of the Christ. It's true, and that's my testimony to you, and I pray God to help you to do your part to share it with those who are yet in darkness and I leave you my love and blessing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.